All right. So I'm talking with Chris Empel, Chief Science Officer at Expressive Neuroscience, who's one of my clients. And we wanted to dive into the world of neurohistology a little bit and see, try to, you know, put some context around the things that we do differently with neurohistology and and see how that relates to other histology applications in drug discovery and, um, you know, what the implications of that are for different drug programs. So, Chris, can you kind of expand on the idea of the importance of histology and drug discovery, you know, compared to, you know, other assay techniques and other um, ways of, of analyzing uh, drugs and, and targets. What does histology tell us that other techniques don't? Yeah. So um, I think histology generally is one of the um, bedrock techniques in neuroscience. It's how uh, neuroscientists have for uh, well over 100 years interrogated the nervous system and figured out how our brains work. Um, it goes back to Ramoni Cajal, possibly the most iconic histologist in the history of neuroscience, who uh, about 100 years ago was looking at the fine structure of the nervous system and um, and illuminating how these the circuits in the brain are incredibly complex, composed of many different cell types and um, that, that vary across different regions of the brain. And that kind of arguably was the beginning of modern neuroscience. After all, the brain is a network, an incredibly complicated network of neurons. So to understand what it does um, normally in a normal functioning person and then in disease is um, critically dependent on understanding what histology provides, basically the spatial organization at a microscopic level of the, of the networks. Okay. And so, so the, uh, this, this, um, the importance of histology in, in neuroscience generally has been, um, uh, has been recognized academically, but unlike other techniques, the, histology hasn't been brought into drug discovery as effectively. And that's sort of what Expressive's goal is, is to, to bring neurohistological techniques into, into drug discovery by improving throughput, reliability, and consistency. Okay. So when we're, we're talking about the CNS, we're really mostly talking about the brain. You know, we could be talking about spinal cord too, um, but specifically in the brain, you know, what makes the brain special as an organ when you're trying to uh, slice and dice tissue? Um, well, one, one thing is it's incredibly complexity, uh, incredible complexity. Um, so that complexity is reflected at various spatial scales. So at the cellular level, as I already mentioned, the, the networks that compose the brain are composed of many cell types and they're, they're arranged in intricate ways at the, at the scale of tens of microns let's say in the cortical circuit. And then across the brain, there's many, many different areas. Um, in the human brain, you've got a, a, you know, a structure that's this big. And um, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of structures that are architectonically distinct from each other. Architectonically means that the, the circuit um, makeup is different between those different areas. That's um, one of those, that's one of those $10 words that I can't afford. Yeah. Well, I can barely pronounce it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so that at those two scales, you know, at the sort of macroscopic gross anatomical scale, then the micro uh, micro scale of the cells and circuits, uh, the complexity is, is really enormous, enormous and is absolutely integral to the function of the organ. That, that is um, less true, tends to be less true for other organs. Of course, every organ needs the right, um, you know, the, 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 the molecular circuits and cell circuits to function right. But in the brain, it's particularly uh, complex. Okay. So what is that? What are the implications of that when we get down to preparing brain samples for lab work? And let's talk about mostly rodent here, um, either, you know, rat or mouse, because those are, you know, some of the most common models that we see in, in neuroscience. Yeah. So, so if we, um, think about a, a brain as compared to, let's say muscle tissue or a blood sample or something like that. Um, in, in the case of non CNS tissue, 
basically you, you what, what you tend to do is you take uh, if you're doing histology you tend to take a section of the uh of the organ and without too much regard to exactly where you're sectioning and where you know what part of the organ you're you're looking at you just can't do that for the brain because as i said you know the the um the the structure of the brain in terms of different um cortical circuitry areas is is so complex you have to know exactly where you are in the brain so that 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 goes from the moment you get the brain, section it, and then put it onto uh, onto slides, or in our case, plates, and image it. That whole time, you have to know exactly, you know, where each piece is relative to the intact organ, and that's really one of the things that we um, concentrate on is always knowing every element that we image, be it a cell or a circuit, you know, a, a, any particular image or a brain section, we know exactly where it is in the brain. Okay. Now, if I'm, if I'm doing this and, you know, I have a block of tissue and I take, you know, six micron sections throughout that block, you know, there's, there's technologies out there that allow me to sort of, you know, reassemble that virtually into, you know, what would have been a 3d tissue. Is that the sort of approach that we can take with brain tissue as well? Um, it, it's kind of, um, aspirational. It would be, it would be nice. And, uh, people ask for it all the time. Can you basically image through the whole brain and then reconstruct it in three dimensions so that we know where everything, well, we, we, we do, I think as good a job or even better as anybody else can, regardless of what other people promise. And, um, and so we take great care again, to know exactly as we section the brain, it's like a, you know, we use something akin to a deli slicer section it up when we track all of those sections. And then as we image those sections, we know, and you know, if you call this the Z dimension, we know in the X and Y dimension where every image that we're taking that we've taken is coming from. So from that point of view, we can by mapping everything onto a canonical brain atlas, we can then tell you exactly in X, Y, and Z where the, the brain structure or cell or whatever has come from. Okay. But it's, okay. But it's not really indexed. It's not, it's uh, what's more useful than an X, Y, Z coordinate is this, it's from this particular brain structure. I mean, okay. I can, right. If I, I can give you an X, Y, Z coordinate, but it's meaningless unless it's tied to a brain structure. Right. Okay. I imagine that requires a certain amount of precision in handling the sample as you're trying to, you know, prepare it for uh, slicing and, and staining. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. And and again, the, the, these techniques have been worked out over decades in, in different academic neuroscience labs. And um, it, yeah, it involves uh, very carefully tracking, you know, uh, at the right level where the sections are coming from, and then within a section, where exactly you are relative to a reference atlas. Okay. Now I've spent a little bit of time in a microtome, and while when I want to say a little bit, I mean probably like half an hour total in my career. <clears throat> but I developed in that half hour, I developed a appreciation for sort of the manual skill required to get sections out of a block into a water bath onto a slide <clears throat> and have them present relatively neatly when it comes time for staining. I imagine that, you know, if you, even if you have somebody that's pretty skilled and, you know, this experience of mine kind of comes from our clinical setting, but even if you have somebody that's reasonably skilled, you still end up with, you know, folds and tears and other sort of artifacts that I imagine would um, sort of disrupt the spatial picture that you're looking to recreate. How do you, how do you confront that and, and get around it? Yeah, um, this this goes back. Uh, maybe I'll digress a little bit into the history of uh, neuroanatomy and neurohistology. Um, uh, traditionally, when people wanted to look at inside the brain through a microscope, it was necessary to section that brain really very thinly, like you know, on the order of five to ten micron sections. And the reason is that uh, the the light microscopy that was available was transmitted light. So you'd have to shine light through the preparation. The light has to get through. And then also the light can't scatter too much. If you've got a really thick piece of tissue, 
um, you're going to be focusing on the tissue, but light's going to scatter everywhere. It's just going to be a big blur. So for that reason, it was necessary to section things very thinly. And that became kind of the, the standard methodology for, for, um, for most of the history of neuroscience. And then it's only been recently, relatively recently, that um, fluorescence confocal microscopy and other kind of more clever uh, mic microscopic methods became available in the last decades. And they allow you to do optical sectioning, very fine optical sectioning of the tissue. And that totally changes the game. At that point, you don't need to section thinly. Instead, you take thick sections and you can, you can image a super thin or even thicker section. It's up to you uh, when you're sitting at the microscope how, 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 uh, how thick the section is that you're imaging through. Um, that gives you some advantages, right? You can make your selection. How far from the surface, the tissue where you've cut, are you going to image? You can be very consistent in the depth, and you can you can change that depth. You can also see the um, structure that you're imaging in the context of what's above and below, which wasn't really possible with those original thin sections, right? You just see everything that's in that section. You don't know what's high, what's 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 below, and then critically, you don't know what's outside of the section. Right, because that's gone. That's uh, cut off. Um, so that that is the reason that most academic neurobiology labs have um, adopted the procedures that we've adopted, which is using thick, relatively thick, fifty to one hundred micron um, vibratome cut sections, um, imaged with confocal microscopy uh, using immunofluorescence. So that's standard in in high power neuro, uh, academic neurohistology labs. That's what we've implemented, uh, as opposed to a lot of the more traditional uh, neurohistology, which is done on these thin sections with chromogenic stains, which require transmitted light rather than fluorescence. Right. Okay. So within, you know, the drug discovery space, I think when I, you know, look at different um, programs in cancer and, and researchers that are doing applications there, one of the drives over the past probably decade or maybe longer has been, okay, how can we take this workflow and automate it, right? Everybody likes uh, things that you can put on a liquid handler because you can rapidly scale, um, you can rapidly scale assays and screens and things like that. With histology, that's been a lot more difficult. We have slide scanners now and we have automated slide stainers, but in terms of the sample prep, Correct me if I'm wrong, but we're still in a very much a manual space there. Yeah, that's right. That's that's what we've chosen to adopt. Uh, you're right. There there are um, there are methods to automate that upfront process of sectioning and staining. Um, we've we found, or I have found, generally that um, those there's just problems associated with those. Also, they those tend to be based on those thin sectioning methods, not the um, the uh, the confocal base for us that I was just talking about. Um, so, what we've decided to do is implement a protocol that is um, rather than automated, it's very uh, well defined and uh, well kind of well oiled. Like uh, we, we've very carefully removed all the pain points from the protocol, and we've made it very easy to execute. So it's quite, so, so a person who's not very experienced can come in and be shown how to do, how to carry out the staining, how to carry out the mounting, how to carry out the sectioning, all that stuff, um, and do a really good job at it with, uh, with the correct supervision. So they can become independent quite quickly. That's not true. And this is going back to your last question, actually. Um, it's, that's not true of uh, cryostat, like the thin section based methods, which really require a very skilled operator. So I, you know, I hate to use this word, but it's, it, it's meaningful. It's kind of an idiot proof procedure that we've put in, in place on the staining end. So that um, uh, the, the, the staining that we do can be carried out by uh, technicians flawlessly. And then um, once the sections are mounted, that's when the automation comes in because we use a okay. uh, high content in instrumentation to uh, to do the imaging. And then uh, downstream of that, 
we use a lot of automated and semi-automated approaches to uh, to analyze the data, to process the data into the okay. really the, the figures or whatever it is that we want for the customer. Well, so let's switch gears to that then, because that's in a lot of ways as big of a challenge as handling all these heterogeneous samples is that once you start to approach a, the scale that you want, then you have generated a, a fair amount of data. So in the case of whole slide scanners, you get a large image per slide uh, and that has to be stored and um, and then analyzed. And so with you know your plate-based process, you've got the, the imaging relatively automated, you know, any, any high content system that has a degree of automation can work through a stack of plates. Um, and they're not living cells. So you don't have any of the environmental That's right. uh, constraints that you would have with a live cell assay. Um, with regard to the analysis, then like, how do you start to get through all that, all that data you generate? Because you have, uh, you know, I imagine images at different levels of magnification and then probably different analysis routines that you may want to run on that. And you may not know in advance, you know, which analyses uh, you want to test until you actually can visualize some of what the, you know, high magnification images look like. So I, what's your approach to that? Yeah, well, that really brings up um, the core of what we do. It's really built around a relational database that we've designed that gives all of the data and the metadata associated with the experiments uh, a home. And um, this is actually a rare thing in histology. Um, relational databases are super, are incredibly powerful. They're everywhere. If you have big data sets, you absolutely need them. Traditionally with histology, they're just not used. So what ends up happening, and anybody who's done histology academically will know this, what ends up happening is you can take, you can do a very small experiment with a very small number of animals or very small number of sections, a few images, and analyze them for a paper and you're okay. As soon as you try to scale that up at all, you're completely lost because now you've got, you know, 17,000 images that, and, and they're representing different conditions, different brain locations, all that stuff. And you're lost. You can't, you just don't know what to do with the data. That's what, that's the problem that we've solved with our uh, expert system. Every, everything has a, a, a home and that then allows us to very quickly go through all the steps you mentioned, right? We can, at, at any point in the, in the processing, we can look in, see what the data look like, um, and make decisions on uh, further processing steps. And that's all done through our, um, what we call our expert web interface. It's a web-based user interface that is really a window onto the relational database and allows us internally and also our customers if they choose to uh, purchase an instance of the database of the of the web interface it allows uh, the scientists to uh, do of all of the analysis uh, in a supercharged way i mean literally a lot of the data sets we have have tens of thousands of images associated with them and the scientist does not have to know anything about that because they're just seeing the variables that they want and um, and acting according to that Okay. So on that scope, you know, when we get to levels of data like that and, and systems like you described to, to keep it organized, there's a danger that that becomes sort of a black box for, you know, analysis, because then you have to rely a lot on the software. And like you said, the end scientists may not know the images that are involved or may not, um, uh, you know, and may not care. Like when you want to really probe deeper into this, like how, how do you make that that level of verification accessible? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. So um, typically what, what we do, it's basically based on spot checking, right? So, you, you know, we've got a lot of experience with our system, so we know what to trust and what not to trust. And so we go ahead through the, uh, quite confidently through the analysis process, come up with our plots, right? Um, that are, that will be meaningful for the customer. But then the customer might ask, or we might ask, like, oh, is that an artifact or is that not? So then, th then it's very easy for us to pick a point in that plot or a bunch of points or maybe a whole condition in that plot and go backwards through the chain to make sure, does it, everything make sense? How does this actually relate to the uh, initial image data? Um, and that is very much facilitated by, by our system. So it's something that we do routinely 
as I said, we kind of initially, when we do the analysis, we step forward pretty quickly, knowing that these artifacts are rare or being sensitive to what they could be. But then always at the end, there's always that concern. Well, maybe we've missed something. And that at that point, that's when you want to step back and do the spot checks to make sure you, you haven't missed anything. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've, uh, I've sold different imaging systems and software in the past, <clears throat> and I'm still surprised that, that, the data management is an issue, right? And part of it is, like you said, we haven't always had the scale of studies we want on the neuroscience side anyway, to really, you know, get to a scaled analysis. Um, and now it seems like, you know, we're, we're taking that, that path of, okay, we've got techniques that are valid and solid in academic settings. We're trying to port those into industry settings let's look at it a different way. What do you think is coming next for histology in the neuroscience lab? Um, that's a good question too. Well, expressive neuroscience, that's one thing that's coming next as we hope to expand and, and get new customers. Cause we do think that we will uh, enable a lot of research that just hasn't been possible before. Um, then in terms of, uh, are you, are you thinking about like what kinds of technologies or well, I'm thinking, you know, both on the, um, the tissue side, the wet side, as well as on the, like the analysis side, you know, it's, we have, you know, gosh, automating the sample processing has been hard in histology for some time, but on the analysis side, again, we're getting like, you know, increasing amounts of computing power that's more readily available. So yep. I would think that would open up some doors. So what's, what's like the next unsolved problem that you think is going to get yeah, well, um, I guess yeah. On the technology end, there, of course, there there are um, technologies like light sheet imaging, which just give you kind of uh, you know they they give you meaningful data faster, um, and so that's something we're certainly interested in. Something we haven't gotten into yet, but something that would definitely um, uh, kind of in a modular way, which we could onboard into our our product, uh, our our expert system. Um, then there are things like um, uh, other imaging methods, like super high resolution, like super resolution systems. And that is something we already, we do do. Uh, so our, our typical high content imaging has a resolution of just, you know, um, you know, half a micron around the resolution of, um, uh, 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 of the wavelength of light. Whereas um, we do use, uh, we have an access to another system, which gives us a uh, higher resolution down to about 0.1 micron. And that just opens up a whole different level of analysis where you can look at lysosomes and cells and synapses, dendritic spines, all that stuff. So that's on the, um, on the kind of imaging end. Um, on the um, analysis side, I guess the big thing, and of course this is a big buzzword, is machine learning. And I'm traditionally very skeptical of buzzwords. I, to me, they're just a word until you see what they can do. And um, I have been converted recently <laughs> um, because we, um, we recently started to uh, apply machine learning. We just, uh, of course, one of our founders is an informaticist, right? That, so so that, that explains why we're so heavily into informatics. And um, we, we decided to test um, uh, whether we could onboard um, open source machine learning algorithms um, to, to, to help us. So we applied it to one of our um, uh, sort of bread and butter analysis um, functions, which is segmentation of cells, seg segmentation of cell nuclei, um, which is something we, we accomplished previously with traditional um, stepwise algorithms. And it worked okay. It was slow, computationally expensive, and it, it, again, it worked okay, but there are a lot of false positives, false negatives. We would have to manually clean up the data. Um, then uh, Dave, Dave Rose, co-founder I'm talking about, head of informatics, um, had a breakthrough with this uh, machine learning algorithm. And we, we ended up um, being able to in improve the level of function, the, uh, the, the functionality of our segmentation module by um, at least twofold and increase, increased efficiency. I would say more than twofold, depending on how you measure it. I mean, now we're really up to like 90% of cells we're identifying with beautiful segmentation 
Um, and yes, a few cells are still left fine. It's not perfect. But the nice thing about machine learning is you can continue to improve it. So we think that's going to get up well beyond 90%. That's just an example. So that's our first foray into machine learning. We have all sorts of ideas on how we're going to uh, extend that to different things like cell type identification, um, quality control uh, uh, functions, you know, removing false positives and false negatives that occur for different reasons, and then uh, other sort of downstream uh, analysis applications. So, so really, the, uh, it's opened a new world, and we think that it, that's going to drive us forward. And I think we're getting in at the right time, just as those open source tools are really beginning to uh, bear fruit. And it's not just us, actually. Everybody else's eyes are being opened by things yeah. like chat GPT and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, I look forward to seeing some of those improvements. Yeah. Simple. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Owen. Nice to talk to you.